Hi guys, thanks for tuning in. In this video, I'm going to discuss how you can partition your student body into an A group and B group in a way that allows for social distancing protocols to be followed in as many classrooms as possible. Now, while many students are just beginning their summer break, teachers and administrators were already busy planning for what school's going to look like in the fall. It's obviously way too early to say exactly what a typical school day is going to look like, but we do know that we need to prepare for the possibility of having fewer students in each classroom with more space between student desks. Now, a lot of schools are planning on partitioning students into an A group and a B group in order to comply with these recommendations. I can illustrate what this would look like. So let's pretend we have a first period math class and a first period biology class, each of which has six students. Now, our job is to assign half of each class to an A group and the other half to a B group. Now, the idea is the A group will attend school for a week, while the B group will stay home and learn remotely. And then the next week, it swaps. The B group attends school, while the A group learns remotely. And it makes sense, right? You've met your social distancing requirements, and you do that throughout all of your first period classes. And you're able to successfully socially distance in all of your first period classes. The only thing left to do is to figure out how to assign each student to either the A group or the B group. And at first this sounds really easy. You just randomly assign half of each first hour class to A and the other half to B. And we've met our social distancing guidelines. Every single classroom has been partitioned in such a way that during the A week, you have enough space to spread out desks. And then during the B week, likewise, you have plenty of space to spread out your desks and achieve your social distancing goals. The problem is when the bell rings for second hour, because now all bets are off, right? Because these original assignments were random, most schools are bound to have numerous classrooms with many more A's than B's, or vice versa. So for example, say you've got a second period history class where just because of how your A-B assignments have interacted with your school's course schedule and rosters, you just get unlucky, and you end up with six A's going to that second period history class and now it's only second hour and we've already failed at our social distancing goal. Of course, there is another possibility as well. It's also possible that due to your random A-B assignments that you get lucky and you end up with half A's and half B's in your second period history class and everybody's happy because you've met your social distancing goal. So the point I'm trying to make here is that your choice of A-B assignments matters. The interaction of those A-B assignments with your course schedule can either lead to a positive outcome or a negative outcome in terms of social distancing. So now that we know that some A-B assignments work better than, than others, the goal is to find the best one. And someone might say, oh, perfect, I get how this works. We have 3,000 students in our school, so let's just go into Microsoft Excel, make a spreadsheet with 3,000 rows in it, each row will represent a student, and we'll just go through and we'll manually pick A's and B's We'll just try all the combinations till we get it perfect. Of course, that, that's not going to work, because if you have 3,000 students in a school, that would be two to the 3,000 different ways of assigning A and B to those students. And someone might say, okay, let's try all two to the 3,000. But that's a very, very large number. Give it a trillion years, you still won't get 1% of the way through that list of potential solutions to check. In fact, even if you had access to the world's fastest supercomputer, you still can't try every way of assigning A and B to 3,000 students. So we need a different technique. And the idea is to write a computer program that tries to find a reasonably good solution, even if it isn't perfect. The technique is called a genetic algorithm, and our goal here is to do much better than we could do by assigning A and B by hand. So we want to do better than a human can do and we want to get as close as possible to meeting our social distancing goal in as many classrooms as possible. Now, the way to look at this is to realize that each potential solution is just a list. It's a list of 3,000 A's and B's. So for example, here's a potential solution to our problem that I randomly generated. So student number one at the school would be assigned to the A group, student number two to the A group, student number three to the B group, student number four to the B group, and so on and so forth. You can randomly generate another potential solution. In this scenario, student number one was assigned to the B group, while student number two is assigned to the A group, and so on and so forth. 
And you could generate as many of these potential solutions as you'd like, but what we really care about is the quality of those solutions. So each of these potential solutions can be evaluated on its fitness. In this case, our measure of fitness is our ability to achieve social distancing in individual classrooms. So what you would do is you would take your assignment of A's and B's and you would compare it against your school's course schedule and you would count the number of classrooms where social distancing is possible. So for potential solution number one, it looks like we have 401 socially distant classrooms out of 600 classes that run at this school throughout the day. Potential solution number two, we do a little bit better. 438 socially distant classrooms out of 600. Potential solution number three, eh, not so good, only 390. So what we realize is some of these potential solutions are fitter than other potential solutions. Our assignment of A's and B's matters. Now, if you kind of squint at it and, and, and think about it from a different perspective, that list of A's and B's can, can almost look like the genetic code for an organism. It almost looks like biology class, right? And so the organism I picked for this example are tulips, because there's a lot of variation in a tulip population. So tulip number one has its own unique genetic code. It looks like its own unique tulip, and it has its own fitness score. Same thing for tulip number two, its own unique genetic code. The tulip itself looks unique, and it has its own unique fitness score, and so on and so forth. Now, what we want to do is we want to kind of model the idea of evolution that we know from our biology class in our algorithm, where we select for fitter tulips in the hopes of having future generations of even fitter tulips. Now, if you take a large enough group of these tulips, these potential solutions, they start to look like a population. So what I have here is a list of 1,000 tulips, a population of tulips, again, each of which with, with its own unique genetic code, its own unique fitness score, and for the sake of this example, its own picture. Now, we could think of that list of 1,000 tulips as our first generation of tulips. And what we want to do is we want to select the fittest individuals to be the parents of the tulips in our second generation. So what you do is you take your list of 1,000 tulips and you look through and you say, oh, look at this. Tulip number two has a high fitness score. It's a very beautiful tulip. Similarly, tulip number five also has a very high fitness score. What we're going to do is we're going to select tulip number two and tulip number five to be the parents of two children that are going to move on to our second generation. Here's how, how this idea is going to work. So you take tulip number two, tulip number five, and you generate a random number between, in this case, one and 3,000. And that's where you're going to cut the genetic code for your tulips. And then you're going to swap their DNA. So in this example, the random number I generated was eight. And so I'm going to slice the genetic code for tulip number two after eight letters. Same thing for tulip number five. Slice the genetic code after eight letters. And then we're going to swap. Child number one gets the first eight letters from tulip number two and the remainder of its genetic code from tulip number five. The second child is the opposite of that. Child number two is the first eight letters of tulip number five and the remainder of its genetic code from tulip number two. Now these two children get to move on to the next second generation. And what our hope is, is because we are picking these fittest tulips, we assume that there's something about the way they assign A's and B's that's favorable, right? This assignment of A's and B's somehow achieves a level of social distancing that other assignments of A's and B's did not achieve. And then by doing these swaps, what we're hoping to do is get lucky where we get part of a favorable part of tulip number two and another favorable part of the solution in tulip number five. And when you do this mixing, you get an even more favorable solution that, you, that will get an even higher fitness score that again will move on to the next generation. Now you could repeat this process enough times to get a second generation of 1,000 tulips. And our goal is for these tulips to be even fitter than the parents that they came from in the previous generation. And you can see in this example that I made up, I have these fitness scores creeping up a little bit. So now we have 
a child with a fitness score of 451, and a little bit further down the line, another child with a fitness score of 450, which are slightly better fitness scores than what we saw in the previous generation. Now, I do have to mention that there are two other recommended techniques. I do recommend using something called elitist selection as well. This idea would be taking the top 10 or maybe 20% of the individuals from your previous generation and let them move on to the current generation unaltered. No swapping, no mutation. Just keep those top 10 to 20% of your previous generation so we don't lose any good information that was in those solutions. And I also recommend using mutation. This adds some diversity to our gene pool. So for each child that we generate, we're going to randomly swap a small percentage, somewhere around 1%, 2% of our A's and B's. What that'll do for us is continually, at each generation, add in a little bit of noise that can help us get a possibly favorable mutation that improves our solution even further. And it also helps your, your algorithm from getting insular. What you don't want to do is just keep mixing the same set of A's and B's over and over again and never really make progress. This added genetic diversity helps our solutions progress from one generation to the next. And sometimes the mutation is favorable enough that it bumps up our fitness even higher than it would have had that mutation not been there. Now we repeat this for hundreds, maybe thousands of generations till you've gotten either really close to your fitness goal or you run out of some sort of resource. This algorithm will be limited by the amount of time you have to run the program or the amount of computational power you have at your fingertips or the amount of memory you have on the machine that's running the algorithm. But in this example, I let the algorithm run to generation number 1000. So 1000 tulips at a time for 1000 generations. And what you do is you take the fittest tulip from the final generation and that is your optimized solution. You can see that uh, what I have ended up with is this fittest tulip from generation number 1000 achieves a fitness score of 515, which is significantly better than what we were able to get just by picking A's and B's randomly. And it's also significantly better than what you'd be able to get by manually assigning the A's and B's on your own. And you can think of this fittest individual being the fittest out of one million tulips, right? Because if we had a thousand generations, each containing one million tulips, this is the best that we've done over a million possible tulips over the course of this algorithm. Uh, so this technique is called a genetic algorithm, and it's a well-known technique for schedule optimization. Schedule optimization is difficult, and this is a heuristic algorithm that can get us to a reasonably good solution in a reasonable amount of time. A couple other things that I would, would like to mention, I already alluded to this, but I'll say it again. The point here is this algorithm, while not perfect, it'll assign students to an AB group with a level of social distancing that would not be possible to achieve by hand. We're trying to do better than a human could ever do on their own. The other thing I should mention is that you can easily modify this process to assign students to A, B, C, D groups. Schools are expecting to only have 25% of their students in the classroom at one time. You can also set up A, B, C, D groups so that A plus B is about 50% of the school and C plus D would be about 50% of each classroom. Um, that way, you, if you have a rolling transition, maybe for a few weeks you just have the A's in the building and just the B's, then just the C's, just the D's, and then after a period of time, you bring back the A plus B's together, and then you swap and it's the C plus D's together. So you can easily modify the algorithm to accommodate that, but for the sake of this video, it was a lot easier just to explain it for A and B, but you could certainly partition further. And then finally, I should mention that you can treat bus routes as an additional classroom. So uh, you can take care of transportation requirements at the same time. A bus route is just a group of students at a particular space at a particular time. That's no different than a classroom. There's nothing different between first hour math and before school bus routes. So you can add those into your algorithm and sort out transportation requirements that meet social distancing guidelines at the same time. Um, in my next video, what I'll do is I'll actually show you how to use a Python script that I wrote to implement this AB partitioning at your own school. Um, and actually, I, I wrote my algorithm for ABCD partitions, so I, I think I'll showcase that one.
But thank you guys for tuning in, and I hope you found this subject interesting, and hopefully my explanation was helpful.